published in 1897, is one of the all-time great money-making novels. It has been sold in millions of copies throughout the world, and in America it has not been out of print since first published there in 1899. This greatest of all horror classics has also been a hit play in several countries and has inspired more commercially successful films than any other novel. New Dracula movies are still being produced on a regular basis. Dracula was written by the Irish author Bram Stoker, best known in his time as the business manager of Henry Irving, one of the most famous theatrical personalities and actors of the Victorian age. Stoker is supposed to have modelled Count Dracula's physical appearance on Irving. The novel tells the story of Count Dracula, who leaves his ancestral home in Transylvania and journeys to England, taking with him several boxes of Transylvanian earth, as his daylight hours must be spent resting on his native soil. However, at night, Dracula's lust for blood becomes unquenchable, his brain power limitless and his physical strength irresistible. Indeed, he plans to control the world by turning everyone into vampires. At the end, the hero, Jonathan Harker, with the assistance of the vampire expert, Dr. Van Helsing, tracks him to his lair in the Carpathians, and there he is finally destroyed. His head is cut off by a kukri, or Gurkha, knife, and a Bowie knife is plunged into his heart. Transylvania, which means the land beyond the forest, is often thought to be a mythical place. In fact, it is an ancient province of Romania which consists of a high plateau ringed by the rugged Carpathian mountains. Even today, it is one of the wildest and least known parts of Europe. Stoker made free use of Transylvanian history, folklore and geography to create an atmosphere of terror. He wrote that every known superstition in the world was gathered into the horseshoe of the Carpathians as if it were some sort of imaginary whirlpool. Stoker never visited Transylvania, but gained most of his knowledge of the British Museum chiefly from an old guidebook. Peasant life in the more remote villages of Transylvania has not changed much for centuries and belief in vampires and other superstitions is still strong, even though such things are rarely spoken of today. The population is of very rich national origins, Romanian, Hungarian, Slav, German, and Sekei. In the book, Count Dracula speaks of his descent from these Sekeis, whose ancestors were probably Huns. <laughs> Bram Stoker located Dracula's castle at the Borgo Pass near Bistrica in northern Transylvania. According to the novel, it was not mentioned in any guidebook, nor did it appear on any map. Stoker wrote, We looked back and saw where the clear line of Dracula's castle cut the sky. We saw it in its grandeur, perched a thousand feet on the summit of a sheer precipice. There was something wild and uncanny about the place. We could hear the distant howling of wolves.
Vlad Sepesh Dracula was a Wallachian prince of the 15th century, described in contemporary German pamphlets as a monster of tyrannical cruelty. Stoker was fascinated by Vlad and decided to resurrect him as Count Dracula. There is no evidence that Vlad Dracula was regarded as a vampire in his own times. Stoker simply drew upon the rich Romanian vampire tradition in creating his Dracula. Count Dracula, as described in the novel, closely resembles various 15th century portraits of Vlad. Stoker writes, his face was a strong aquiline with a thin, high-bridged nose and peculiarly arched nostrils. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, as far as I could see under the heavy moustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking. Vlad Dracula came to the throne of Wallachia in 1456 under the protection of Hungary. He was best known as Sepesh, which means impaler, because of his fondness for that form of execution. However, he was also known as Dracula, which can mean either devil, son of the devil, or dragon in ancient Romanian. Some historians consider Vlad a hero who fought for Christianity and the independence of his country against the Turks, while others claim that he was a madman who killed and tortured wantonly for sadistic pleasure. Not only Stoker was intrigued by Dracula. Countless legends about his bloody deeds and macabre sense of humor persist to this day in Transylvania. Vlad Dracula may not have been more cruel than many other rulers of the 15th century, such as Mohammed II himself, Ivan the Terrible, or Cesare Borgia, but his executions were much greater in number. In creating Count Dracula, Stoker may have been intrigued by the similarity between Vlad's impalings and the killing of vampires by driving stakes through their bodies. It is said that Dracula's chief pleasure was to dine with his court, surrounded by dead and dying people impaled on poles. Once, a certain nobleman was supposed to have complained that he could not enjoy his meal because of the stench of rotting corpses surrounding the table. Dracula thereupon had the nobleman impaled on a much higher stake than the others, so that he would be above the stench. Dracula's first short reign was dominated by his confrontation with Mohammed the Conqueror of Turkey. The Sultan disapproved of Vlad's alliance with Hungary and was angered by his refusal to pay tribute and deliver the children he demanded for his corps of janissaries or bodyguard. The Sultan sent envoys to negotiate a truce with Dracula. However, they had secret instructions to lure him into a trap where he would be seized by Turkish troops. When the emissaries refused to remove their turbans in Vlad's presence, he ordered the turbans nailed to their heads and sent them away, saying that the Turks must learn to respect the customs of a great leader. The Sultan was enraged and sent a large army to destroy Dracula. However, Vlad was forewarned. He took the Turks by surprise and defeated them, proceeding to a mass impalement of his captives. He wrote to King Matthias of Hungary that 23,809 men had been slain and impaled. Vlad was certain of the figure because their heads had been carefully collected, apart from 884 who were burnt in their houses and whose heads, of course, could not be shown. The Sultan was driven to fury by the mass impalement of his army and invaded Wallachia with a vast force one year later. Although greatly outnumbered, Dracula inflicted heavy losses on the Turks by using guerrilla tactics. Legend has it that he rewarded those of his own soldiers who were wounded in the front of their bodies, but impaled those wounded in the back. The Turks might have lost the campaign had not Dracula's own brother, Radu, who was in favor with the Sultan, succeeded in turning most of Vlad's nobles against him. At last, Dracula was forced to retire to his remote castle in Transylvania, high in the mountains above the Argesh River. Bram Stoker did not know of the actual castle Dracula, but his description of the Count's castle at the Borgo Pass is uncannily apt. 
The real Castle Dracula is perched on top of a rock 1,000 feet high and is nearly inaccessible from the valley. The original fortress was very old. However, Vlad rebuilt the structure when he came to power and ever since it has been known as the castle of Vlad the Impaler. Reconstruction of the castle was a nearly superhuman feat, accomplished in typical Dracula fashion, according to legend. One of Vlad's brothers, Mircea, was killed in Turgoviste. Dracula retaliated by seizing all of the townspeople on Easter Day when they were dressed in their finest clothes. He impaled the old people and put the younger people, men and women, to work rebuilding the castle. They are supposed to have labored until their clothes became rags and dropped from their backs. Many, no doubt, died from overwork or fell from the cliffs, but the work was finished within a few months. After escaping the Sultan's army, Dracula waited at his castle for help from King Matthias of Hungary, but none came. Finally, the Turks laid siege to the fortress, during which Dracula's wife took her own life by casting herself from a parapet to the Argus Valley far below. Dracula himself was forced to flee, either through a secret tunnel or on a horse, shod backwards to confuse pursuers. Vlad never returned to Castle Dracula. He lost the support of King Matthias through intrigues by his enemies and was imprisoned in Buda for several years. Little is known about Dracula's life in exile, but a Russian story relates that he used to catch mice and buy birds in the market, then torture and impale them. Vlad Dracula has inspired countless anecdotes. Most of them portray him as merciless, yet possessed of a strange sense of justice and tragic destiny, much like Count Dracula. The following story is a case in point. A Hungarian merchant came to Vlad's city. While he slept, someone stole 160 gold ducats from him. The merchant went to Dracula and told him of his loss. Dracula said, go your way, and in the morning you will find your gold. He then commanded that a search be made for the gold throughout the city and said that if the thief was not found, he would burn the entire town. When the merchant arose the next morning, he found his money returned. He counted it once and then twice there was one ducat too many. The merchant went again to Dracula and said, My lord, I have found the gold, but there is one ducat more which is not mine. Dracula then revealed that he had ordered the extra ducat placed there and said that if the merchant had not told him about it, he would have impaled him with the thief. The merchant was very grateful to Vlad and took his cart and left the city. Though Dracula showed a certain kindness to the merchant, he is said to have solved the problem of poverty in his kingdom by inviting all poor people and beggars to a great banquet and then setting fire to the hall. Everyone inside was burned alive. Dracula was greatly respected by his countrymen for he would allow no theft or other crime on penalty of death. Priest, noble or commoner, no one was spared his terrible righteousness. In a particular place there was a spring of fresh cold water and many came to drink. Dracula had made a large, fine, golden cup and placed it by the spring. All who drank from the cup returned it to its place, and while Vlad lived, no one dared steal it. This 15th century painting of the martyrdom of St. Andrew included Vlad Dracula as an observer. As St. Andrew was the patron of the Saxons, Vlad may have been shown because of his reputed cruelty towards Saxons. However, in Romania, St. Andrew was also said to be the protector of vampires. After many years of exile, Vlad finally managed to recover his throne in 1476, but died only two months later, probably killed accidentally by his own men. He had disguised himself as a Turkish soldier in order to obtain precise information about the enemy. His head was sent to Istanbul as a trophy for the Sultan. Dracula's headless body was said to have been found by monks from Snagov Monastery in the marshes near Bucharest 
who secretly interred Vlad in a crypt facing the chapel altar. In 1931, Dracula's tomb was opened, but the casket and body were missing. Later on, another grave was discovered near the front door to the chapel. It is possible the body was moved because the monks did not want to have someone of Dracula's sinister reputation buried near the altar. A Romanian peasant belief holds that Vlad Dracula's death was supernatural, that he will someday rise again to save the race in a time of great trouble. A famous Romanian poem goes, Dracula, where are you now that we need you? Many say that Dracula never died, that he is undead, which is also the state of the vampire. Living today in the valley of Argish, below Castle Dracula, is the gypsy Tinker. She recalls that when her father was laid out for burial in 1932, it was discovered that rigor mortis had not set in, the skin was still pliable, and the cheeks bore a ruddy complexion. The villagers believed that of course he must be a vampire, so they plunged a wooden stake through his heart, and as an added safeguard, burned his body. Vampire belief has existed since the dawn of civilization throughout the world, but has been most common in Eastern Europe. Vampires are creatures of the night who can either be men or women. In Eastern Europe, they are supposed to have two souls and are neither alive nor dead, but undead as one soul never dies. Vampires cannot rest in the grave, but must spend the night searching for victims, people or animals whose blood they drink. The victims either die immediately or gradually waste away and some become vampires after death. At cock crow or when the morning bell tolls, vampires must return to their coffins or risk dissolving in the sunlight. They spend their daylight hours in the grave, their bodies undecomposed, and around their mouths and under their fingernails are traces of blood. The universal fear of death and the impossible desire for eternal life are deeply rooted in vampire belief, as is the oriental concept of reincarnation or eternal return. In Transylvania, vampirism was originally a folk superstition rather than a religious idea. It probably came from Asia by caravan route and with the nomadic Magyars around the birth of Christ, centering in the Carpathian Mountains and mixing with the rich folklore of that region. Who can become a vampire? Criminals, witches, those born with teeth, those under a curse, and young children who die unchristened. The seventh son of a seventh son is doomed. And one must be very cautious of a man who does not eat garlic. Vampires can assume a variety of animal forms, such as large dogs, snakes or bats, and in Romania particularly, wolves and black cats. They are tremendously strong. They cast no shadow, have no reflection in mirrors, and can make themselves invisible by dissolving into a mist. It is also believed that every year on St. Andrew's Eve, vampires meet at places like uh, graveyards to decide on their programs for the coming year. Who is to be killed and by whom? In Transylvanian folklore, vampires are almost always peasants rather than noblemen, as literary tradition would have it. However, Countess Elizabeth Battori, born in 1570, was a famous exception. Her family coat of arms consisted of three wolves' teeth, 
and Elizabeth herself was said to have been a werewolf. In her castle in northern Hungary, she butchered nearly 600 young girls, bathing and showering in their blood to keep her skin unnaturally white. Eventually, her monstrous crimes were discovered and she was walled into a cell in her castle, never again to see the light of day. In Romania, witchcraft, diabolism and vampirism are all closely associated. For instance, the snake or dragon is a very ancient symbol for the devil, which frequently appears in Romanian paintings and literature. The legend of St. George and the Dragon is very reminiscent of both Vlad's impalings and the killings of vampires with stakes. Vampires are also said to be most active between the eaves of St. Andrew and St. George, a superstition which is closely tied to the Greek Orthodox religion. The Greek Orthodox Church has often unjustly been credited with originating the vampire concept. However, the Greek Church has always leaned towards mysticism and attached great importance to complicated rituals and the worship of saints and icons, thus creating a hotbed for all sorts of superstitions. Vampire belief may sometimes have been used by the Church to increase its hold on the people in much the same way as it used belief in witchcraft. For centuries, the Greek Orthodox Church taught that the bodies of those excommunicated would not decompose in the grave. As vampires, according to popular belief, were recognizable because their bodies did not decompose in the grave, excommunication meant becoming a vampire on death. The church claimed that if a priest administered exorcism, this was sufficient to seal the vampire in its grave. However, history shows that most people did not trust the power of the church over vampires. The drinking of blood and sacrificial blood offerings have played an important role in most great religions. For thousands of years, man has endowed blood with magical powers such as that drinking the blood of someone of great strength increases one's own strength. During Mass, a priest drinks wine, which has become the blood of Christ through transubstantiation, and the congregation eats the bread or flesh of Christ, who is thus sacrificed to God anew. The Gospel according to St. John holds a passage which could well apply to the vampire mixing its blood with that of its victim. Except ye eateth the flesh of the Son of Man, and drinketh its blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. The vampire bat has many things in common with its human counterpart. An erect head, web-like hands for wings, and the ability to walk upright. bite from its extremely sharp teeth has an anesthetic quality and its saliva contains an anticoagulant which quickens the flow of blood from the wounds it inflicts on its victims. The attack of the vampire bat is very like that of the folklore vampire. It first stalks and hypnotizes its prey, after which it bites into a vein and begins to lap up blood with its long tongue.
careful in passing old ruins, crossroads and churchyards, especially young maidens, as male vampires are known, for obvious reasons, to prefer them. The erotic element in vampirism is very strong. For instance, the vampire is said to be the only night creature capable of sex, although his children are born without bones. He usually chooses one particular woman in a specific locality to be his bride, and relentlessly pursues her in a kind of macabre courtship. He may attack others, but if he is denied his chosen loved one, he may go berserk and wreak havoc. times, the report of a vampire attack created panic. Everyone took immediate precautions to protect themselves, especially during the hours between sundown and sunrise. Bells were rung to sound the alarm and were thought to frighten vampires away. People shut themselves tightly indoors. Many left the countryside to seek shelter in towns, and shepherds drove their flocks to safety, as vampires might attack sheep as well as humans. At night, Torches were lit outside, and many candles were kept burning inside. People sat up until cockcrow and told stories, for when stories are told, 
Vampires cannot approach. In some areas, vampires were thought to be unable to cross running water, and throughout Transylvania, garlic was an extremely potent weapon. Windows and doors were anointed with this garlic, and all cows and other farm animals were supposed to be rubbed with it to protect them as well. The thorns of wild roses were sure to keep vampires away. Thus, thorns or poppy seeds were spread on the paths leading from the local churchyard to the village. When the vampire took the path, he had to stop to pick up every one of the thorns or seeds. This so delayed him that he could not reach the village before sunrise, at which time he had to return to the grave. Large black dogs with an extra set of eyes painted on them in white also discouraged vampires, though sometimes they became frightened themselves. The church added the cross and the communion wafer as major weapons against vampires. As soon as a vampire began to ravage an area, an all-out effort was made to find its grave and destroy it. One common method of locating a vampire was to choose a boy or girl young enough to be a virgin and seat them naked on a horse of a solid colour which was also a virgin and had never stumbled. The horse was led through the cemetery and over all of the graves. If it refused to pass over a particular grave, a vampire was thought to lie there. The vampire's tomb was also supposed to be recognisable from one or several holes big enough for a serpent to pass through. The most usual way of killing a vampire was to drive a stake through the heart or navel during daylight hours when the vampire lay in its grave. The stake had to be made from a wild rose bush, an ash or asp tree. In some areas, iron bars, preferably heated red hot, were used instead of wood. stake had to be driven through the body and into the ground under the corpse to keep the vampire from rising again. As the stake pierced it, the body twisted in agony and fresh blood flowed. A horrible scream also accompanied the act, after which a look of peace settled on the vampire's face. The final release from torment and real death. Many other means of killing vampires were practiced. The vampire's head was sometimes cut off and put between the legs of the corpse, or the body could be buried at crossroads or burnt and the ashes strewn in a river. According to Romanian legend, 
If a vampire is not found and rendered harmless, it first kills all members of its immediate family and then the other inhabitants of the village. At last, the vampire climbs up into the belfry of the church and calls out the names of any survivors who instantly die. Or, in some areas, the vampire rings the death knell and all who hear it die on the spot. Eastern Europe, and particularly Transylvania, has long been known to folklore experts and devotees of Dracula alike as the centre of vampire belief. But the vampire in literature owes its fame almost entirely to the works of English and Irish authors. The most successful vampire tales were written during the 19th century, culminating in Bram Stoker's Dracula, published in 1897. The great English poet and adventurer Lord Byron directly inspired the first vampire novel, during the summer of 1816, Byron spent rainy evenings at the Villa Diodati in Switzerland, discussing the supernatural with his doctor, John Polidori, and his friends, Shelley, and his wife-to-be, Mary. Byron suggested that they all try to write ghost stories. He himself soon abandoned his attempt at a vampire tale, but Mary Shelley, then only 19, took the challenge seriously and wrote Frankenstein one of the most famous of all Gothic horrors. Polidori turned Byron's unfinished story into The Vampire, published in 1816. He probably intended his vampire, Lord Ruthven, as a parody of Byron, who he felt had mistreated him. Byron did have some classic vampire characteristics. He once, for instance, lived in a half-ruined abbey, and in later years wore only black, ate almost nothing to keep slim, and drank vinegar to make his face pale. He also had an extraordinary power over women and young men. By the middle of the 19th century, interest in vampires and vampirism had spread throughout Europe. In England, weekly serial novels had become the rage. One of the most popular was Varney the Vampire or the Feast of Blood. It was of doubtful literary value, but the piece ended spectacularly with the vampire Baron throwing himself into the hissing mouth of Mount Vesuvius. But it was a woman vampire rather than a man who set the stage for Dracula. Sheridan Lefanu, Irish master of the supernatural, published Carmilla in 1872. The story made a deep impression on Bram Stoker, who was then a civil servant in Dublin and an unpaid theatre critic. Ten years later, the flamboyant red-bearded Irishman became associated with Henry Irving. Just as Polidori had modelled Lord Ruthven on Byron, Stoker no doubt gave Dracula some of Irving's impressive qualities. Bram Stoker claimed that a nightmare about a vampire after a late supper of dressed crab inspired Dracula. However, he had always had an intense interest in the supernatural. He wrote 17 books in all, but only Dracula is really remembered today. He did not live to see the enormous success of his novel, but died in near poverty, according to the death certificate, from exhaustion. Stoker's description of Count Dracula still evokes a sense of mysterious destiny. He wrote, the Count must indeed have been that voyevod Dracula who won his fame against the Turk. If it be so, then he was no common man. For in that time, and for centuries after, he was spoken of as the cleverest and the most cunning, as well as the bravest of the sons of the land beyond the forest, Transylvania. The Draculas were a great and noble race, though now and again were said to have had dealings with the evil one. In one manuscript, this very Dracula is spoken of as Wampir, which we all understand. Too well. 
The Vampire has achieved its greatest popularity as a movie theme. In 1921, Max Schreck became the first film Dracula in Nosferatu. This classic silent film was directed by the German expressionist Friedrich Murnau. It drew openly on Stoker's book, and although Murnau gave Stoker the credit, he did not seek permission. The court ordered the negative and all prints destroyed, but somehow the film survived and was shown on a limited basis in London and America. Legal or not, Nosferatu captured a mood which has seldom been equaled. Bram Stoker, the famous Danish director, Carl Dreyer, was fascinated by Lefanu's story, Carmilla. In 1932, he made his classic film, Vampire, based on the story. Briefly, a young woman is victimized by a vampire. After many adventures, the vampire's helper, Dr. Hieronimko, is buried alive, and the hero drives a stake through the heart of the vampire, an old countess. As always, Dreyer obtained fine performances from his amateur actors. The first mass audience Dracula film was made in 1931 and starred the Hungarian actor Bela Lugosi, who had also played the role of Dracula innumerable times on the stage. The film was an immediate and lasting success. Lugosi, who was born in Transylvania, said that 97% of his fan mail was from women who found Dracula strangely attractive. Although Lugosi remained for most people the one and only Dracula, a number of other Dracula films were produced during the 40s. In 1958, the Dracula tradition was revived in Horror Dracula. The film returned more than eight times its production costs, and the producers, Hammer Films of London, went on to make six more Dracula films over the next 16 years. Seventy-five years have passed since Bram Stoker created his sinister Transylvanian cult. However, he still fascinates vast numbers of people and will no doubt continue to do so.
for there is yet to be another fictional character quite like Count Dracula. When you go to bed tonight and the lights have all been turned out and you're afraid to look behind the curtain and you dread to see the face appearing at the window, just remember, there are such things. Cel moldovean în care oi mai multe mândre și cornă Berbecii mai grași ca ei mai învățați Câinii mai bărbații, câinii mai bărbați Dar ce-a mie 